and welcome to our final lesson this week regarding the novel Animal Farm. Let's go ahead and please take out your language arts notebooks. Turn to a clean sheet for me, please. Let's go ahead and review our objective today. Now, our objective is the same as we had previously in our previous lesson. I can explain the impact of specific words and tones and identity, examples of propaganda in Animal Farm. Today, we're going to be reading Chapter 4 of Animal Farm, and I want you to answer in a Google Doc the following questions. Number one, how has Snowball been preparing for Jones's return? Question two, how is Snowball injured? And question three, why is Boxer upset over the battle? In this chapter, there is going to be a very decisive battle between Jones and the animals. Let's go ahead and read and follow along as I go ahead and read. Again, your digital copy of Animal Farm is presented in your Google Classroom. Chapter four. By the late summer, the news of what had happened on Animal Farm had spread across half the county. Every day, Snowball and Napoleon sent out flights of pigeons whose instructions were to mingle with the animals of neighboring farms and tell them the story of the rebellion and teach them the tune of the beasts of England. Most of the time, Mr. Jones had spent sitting in the tap room of the Red Lion at w uh, Willingdon, complaining to anyone who would listen of the monstrosity and justice he had been su su uh, suffered in being turned out of his property by a pack of good-for-nothing animals. The other farmers sympathized in principle, but they did not want to give him much help. At heart, each of them was secretly wondering whether he could not somehow turn Jones's misfortune to his own advantage. It was lucky that the owners of the two farms which adjoin Animal Farm were on permanently bad terms. One of them, which was named Foxwood, was a large, neglected, old-fashioned farm, much overgrown by the woodland, with all its pastures worn out and its hedges in a disgraceful condition. Its owner, Mr. Plinkington, was an easy-going gentleman farmer who spent most of his time in fishing or hunting according to the season. The other farm, which was called Pinchfield, was smaller and better kept. Its owner was a Mr. Frederick, a tough, shrewd man, perpetually involved in lawsuits with a name for driving hard bargains. These two disliked each other so much that it was difficult for them to come to any agreement, each in the defiance of their own interest. Nevertheless, they were both thoroughly frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm and very anxious to prevent their own animals from learning too much about it. At first, they pretended to laugh and scorn the idea about animals managing a farm for themselves. The whole thing would be over in a fortnight, they said. They put it out at the animals on the manor farm. They insisted on calling it the manor farm. They would not tolerate the name Animal Farm. Was perpetually fighting amongst themselves and were also rapidly starving to death. When time passed and the animals had inevitably not starved to death, Fredrickson and Plinkington changed their tune and began to talk of the terrible wickedness that had now flourished on Animal Farm. It was given out that the animals that practiced cannibalism tortured one another with red-hot horseshoes and that their females in, uh, and had their females in common. This was uh, what came of rebelling against the, the laws of nature, Flink, uh, Frederick, uh, Frederick and Plinkington said. However, these stories were never fully believed. Rumors of a wonderful farm where the human beings had been turned out and the animals managed their own affairs continued to circulate in vague and distorted forms. And throughout the year, a wave of rebelliousness ran through the countryside. Bulls, which had always been uh, tractable, sudden, turned savage. Sheep broke down hedges and devoured the clover. Cows kicked over the pail over. Hunters refused their, uh, refused their fences and shot their riders onto the other side. Above all, the tune and even the words of the Beast of England were known everywhere. It had spread with astonishing speed. The human beings could not contain, contain their rage when they had heard this song, though they pretended to think it was merely ridic ridiculous. They could not understand, they said, how the animals could bring themselves to sing such contemptible rubbish. Any animals caught singing it was given a flogging on the spot, and yet the song was irre irrepressible. The blackbirds whistled in the hedges, and the pigeons cooed in the elms. It even got the din of the uh, smithies and the tune of the church bells. And when the human beings listened to it, they secretly trembled, hearing it in a prophecy of their future doom. Early in October, when the corn was cut and shacked and some of it had already been threshed, a flight of pigeons came whirling through the air and alighted in a yard of Animal Farm in the wildest excitement. Jones and all of his men, with a half dozen others from Foxwood and Pitchfield, had entered the five-bared gate and were coming up the cart track that led to the farm. 
They were carrying sticks except Jones, who was marching ahead with a gun in his hand. Obviously, they were going to attempt to recapture the farm. This had long been expected, and all preparation had been made. Snowball, who had studied an old book of Julius Caesar campaigns, which he had found in the farmhouse, was in charge of the defense operations. He had gave orders quickly, and in a couple of minutes every animal was at his post. All of the animals approached the farm buildings. Snowball launched his first attack. All the pigeons, to the number of 35, flew to and fro over the men's heads and mudded upon them from the mid-air. And while the men were dealing with this, the geese, who had been hiding behind the hedge, rushed out and pecked it viciously at their calves and legs. However, this was only the light skirmishing maneuver, intended to create a little disorder, and the men easily drove the geese off with their sticks. Snowball now launched his second line of attack. Muriel and Benjamin and all the sheep, with Snowball at the head of them, rushed forward and protruded and butted the men with, with, from every side, while Benjamin turned around and lashed at them with his small hoofs. But all... But once again, the men, with their stacks and their uh, hood-nailed boots, were too strong for them. And suddenly, at a squeal from Snowball, which was the, uh, which was the sight signal for retreat, all the animals turned and fled from the gateway yard. The men gave a shout of triumph. They saw, as they imagined, their enemies in flight, and they rushed after them in disorder. This was as ju this was just what Snowball had intended. As soon as they were inside the yard, the three horses, the, th the three cows. And the rest of the pigs, who had been lying in ambush in the cow shed, suddenly emerged in their rear, cutting them off. Snowball now gave the signal for the charge. He himself dashed straight for Jones. Jones saw this coming and raised his gun and fired. The pellets scored bloody streaks along Snowball's back, and the sheep and a sheep dropped dead. Without halting for an instant, Snowball flung his fifteen stone against Jones's leg. Jones was hurled into a pile of dung, and he, his gun flew out of his hands. But the most terrifying spectacle of all was Boxer, rearing up his hind legs and striking out with great iron shed hoofs like a stallion. His very first blow took a stable lad from Foxwood on the skull and stretched his lifelessness in the mud. At the sight, several men dropped their sticks and tried to run. Panic overtook them, and the next moment all the animals together were chasing them around and round the yard. They were gored, kicked, bitten, trampled on. This was not an animal on the farm that did not take advantage of them after the, his own fashion. Even the cat suddenly leapt off, the, off a roof onto a cowman's shoulders and sank his, her claws in his neck, at which he yelled horribly. At a moment when the opening was cleared, the men were, were glad enough to rush out of the yard and make a bolt for the main road. And so within five minutes of, the, of their invasion, they were in ignominious retreat by the sight that the same way in which they had come, with a flock of geese hissing at them and pecking at their calves all the way. All the men were gone except one. Back in the yard, Boxer was pawing with his hoof at the stable. Stable lad, who laid face down the mud, trying to turn him over, but the boy did not stir. He is dead, said Boxer sulfully. I had no intention of doing that. I forgot I was wearing iron shoes. Who will believe that I did not do this on purpose? No sentimentary, comrade, cried Snowball, from whose wounds the blood was still dripping. War is war. The only good human being is a dead one. I have no wish to take life, not, not even human life, repeated Boxer, and his eyes were full of tears. Where is Molly? exclaimed someone. Molly was in fact missing. For a moment there was a great alarm. It was, it was fear that the men might have harmed her in some way, or even carried her off with them. In the end, however, she was found hiding in her stall with her head buried among the hay in the, in the manger. She had taken to flight as soon as the, as the gun went off, and when the others came back looking for her to find her in the stable... Oh, it, it was to find that the stable lad, who in fact was only stunned, had already recovered and made off. The animals had now reassembled the wildest excitement, each recounting their own exploits in the battle at the top of his voice. An impromptu celebration of the victory was held immediately, and the flag was rung up, and the Beast of England was sung a number of times. And then the sheep who had been killed was given a solemn funeral, and a hawthorn brush be painted on her grave. At the graveside, Snowball made a little speech, emphasizing the need for all animals to be ready to die for Animal Farm if need be. The animals decided unanimously to create a military decoration. Animal Hero First Class, which was conferred there and then on Snowball and Boxer. It consisted of a brass medal. They were really some old horse brasses which had been found in the harness room to be worn on Sundays and holidays. There was also Animal Hero Second Class, which is conferred pernominously on the dead sheep. 
There was much discussion as to what, uh, what the battle should be called. In the end, the name, the Battle of the Cowshed, since there, there was an ambush, had been sprung. Mr. Jones's gun had been found lying in the mud, and, there was no, and it was known that there was a supply of cartridges in the farmhouse. It was decided to set up the gun at the, fr the foot of the flagstaff like a piece of artillery, and to fire it twice a year, once on October the 12th, the anniversary of the Battle of the Cowshed, and once on Midsummer's Day, the anniversary of the rebellion. So again, in your Google Doc, please answer the following questions in complete sentences, please, not fragments. Question one, how has Snowball been preparing for Jones's return? Number two, how is Snowball injured? And number three, why is Boxer upset over the battle? Join me next week when we'll be delving into chapters five and six of Animal Farm. Stay tuned.